All right, so we're going to look here at thermochemical equations. And here you see a reaction, you know, when I put solid sodium into liquid water, it produces hydrogen gas and sodium hydroxide. And you see there that it includes the delta H. Delta H equals negative 368.6 kilojoules, and that's per mole based on this balanced reaction. So essentially, a thermochemical equation just includes the enthalpy change. And so there are three important rules. One, you must include the phase labels because the change in enthalpy has, is very much tied into the phase of the substances. So make sure you have solid, liquid, gas, aqueous, etc. If you multiply this equation by any factor, then the delta H must be multiplied by the same factor. That's because we're talking about a state function here. It, it depends on how much. So again, it's kind of per, it's related per mole. So as we'll see here in a second, the amounts change the delta H. So if you mess with this reaction by any factor, you must do so to the delta H as well. And if the equation is reversed, then the delta H is reversed in sign, but stays the same magnitude. So we'll take a look at a few of those here. Now, you can see some thermochemical equations written where the heat is just added into the equation. For example, this one, if I have my solid sodium plus my liquid water, and I make my hydrogen gas, and my sodium hydroxide. Since delta H is negative, it's exothermic, then I could also just say plus 368.6 kilojoules. And that way, heat is a product. All right. If we had an endothermic reaction, then I could potentially see the, you know, let's say 50 kilojoules plus, and then whatever the reaction is, it would be written as a reactant because the delta H would be positive and that would reflect an endothermic reaction. Okay, so just in case you don't see it always with the delta H written in it, you could have it with the heat, the enthalpy change just as a product or a reactant. So here we see the world famous formation of ammonia equation. Nitrogen gas and three moles of hydrogen gas make two moles of ammonia gas. And we see the delta H is negative 91.8 kilojoules. So what would be the enthalpy change if we produced twice as many moles of ammonia? Well, that would be like doubling this equation. And so the delta H would also be doubled. Half as many, that would be like cutting the recipe in half, cutting the reaction in half. And so if I cut the cookie recipe in half, I make half as many cookies. If I cut this ammonia recipe in half, half as much heat is being released. The decomposition of ammonia, well, that would be the reverse of the reaction. And so here we see that the delta H has changed sign. It is now positive, but the magnitude is the same as it was up here in the formation of ammonia. And then, of course, we can use this enthalpy change in stoichiometry problems. All right, so here's the reaction again. It says, how much heat is evolved when 907 grams of ammonia is produced at constant pressure? Well, I simply have to do a stoichiometry problem starting with 907 grams of ammonia. Of course, I'm going to want to change that into moles. And then I can use the delta H, negative 91.8 kilojoules, as a conversion factor here. Now it's important, since we're making two moles of ammonia in my balanced equation, I'm saying for every two moles of ammonia produced, 91.8 kilojoules is evolved. And so when I do the proper math, 907 times 91.8 divided by the bottom, which ends up being 34, 2,450 kilojoules are evolved. The question asked how much heat is evolved, so I just answered 2,450. I don't have to worry about the sign here, although it would be negative if they were asking a more detailed question, but here they just said how, how much heat is evolved, 2,450 kilojoules. All right, how do we measure these heats of reaction? 
Well, that's through calorimetry. And there's a couple different ways you can use a calorimeter, all right, for really intense reactions. There's something called a bomb calorimeter. Most of us are doing some calorimetry reactions in lab using a coffee cup, which is totally fine. But there's a couple things that you want to see here. First off is this thing called heat capacity. And again, it's or as it says here, the quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of a sample of a substance one degree Celsius, or Kelvin, since a degree Celsius and a degree Kelvin is the same size. The key here is that we're going to try and raise the temperature of an entire sample. Okay, so depending on the size of the sample, there would be a um, a, a very big difference in the heat capacity of that sample which is why normally we look a little more closely at what's called specific heat. That's the quantity of heat that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram of a sa sample of a substance, one degree Celsius. And so you can find these specific heats in, you know, here this is our textbook, table 6.1, page 237. On the periodic table you can find the specific heat of the elements. Just have to watch the units typically they are involving joules, which is what we want when we do these um, different calculations. But just be careful in case you run across a table or a group of them that is using kilojoules or calories. All right, so here's a, a question, a, a basic type of question asking about how much heat is absorbed by 15 grams of water if its temperature changes from 15 to 60.5 degrees Celsius. Now the standard equation here is Q equals MC delta T or CM delta T. You could possibly see it written both ways. But it's basically just some plug and chug here as long as you know the specific heat. That's what the little C is standing for. Specific heat of water, most often you'll see it as 4.18 or 4.184 and it's joules per gram degree Celsius. So here again this is water 4.184 is the specific heat 15 is the grams 15 grams so that's my mass and then I need the delta T the change in temperature it doesn't matter if the temperature is going up or down I just need the change in temperature so the difference from 15 to 60.5 is 45.5 degrees. When I multiply that together, since my 4.184 is joules per gram degree Celsius, joules per gram degree Celsius, when I multiply by mass, the grams cancel out. When I multiply by delta T, the degree Celsius cancels out, so I get 28. 2,860 joules or 2.86 kilojoules. So typically you might have to try and find the specific heat of a metal in a calorimeter so you heat up the metal to a certain temperature, drop it into a coffee cup calorimeter and the water will absorb the heat released from the metal. Okay, so you could figure out how much heat by looking at this. You know how much water is in your calorimeter, you see that its temperature change, you know the specific heat of water and so you figure out how much heat went into that water. Then you could use that value to figure out the specific heat of a metal if it was unknown. So again calorimetry, a calorimeter is anything that measures the heat absorbed or released during a physical or chemical change. Again a lot of us are using just the coffee cup style. A bomb calorimeter you can watch a little YouTube video if you'd like, but essentially it's got a sealed chamber, uh, combustion reactions going on, you, you heat up what's going on in there, oxygen is being supplied, the bomb, the chamber, is surrounded by water that's constantly being stirred and the temperature is being measured so you could see the absorption or release of heat. And like this is how they find the, you know, ca how many calories are in food and some other reactions. But again, perhaps if you go into a collegiate lab, or if you're fortunate enough in your lab to have a bomb calorimeter, you could do some of those. Our first introduction to calorimetry, besides specific heat, it was finding some heats of solution, okay, dissolving different compounds into water, 
and figuring out the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole. Some compounds, when you dissolve them in water, release heat. Some compounds absorb. So we can have exothermic and endothermic um, processes. And that will depend on the interactions between the ions in the compound, and we'll talk about that later. But right now, let's suppose 12.5 grams of barium chloride is added to 125 milliliters of water in a coffee cup calorimeter. Our water started at 23 degrees Celsius. It dropped to 18.2. So I want to know the heat of solution for the barium chloride and then the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole. So I'm going to use my Q equals C M delta T. And since we're predominantly talking about water here, I'm going to stick with the same C of 4.184. My mass now is the mass of the solution. So I have to take 125 milliliters, which of course for water we can say grams, since its density is 1 gram per milliliter. And I need to add the 12.5 grams of my barium chloride to that. Okay, and then my delta T again will just be the change in temperature. So 4.184 for my specific heat of water. 137.5 is my mass of the solution. And then my change in temperature, 23 down to 18.2, is 4.8 degrees. So that's my heat of solution. Okay. You can, of course, use this proper sig figs. You could say 2,800 joules. But since we're going to keep using this number, I'm not going to round yet. Because I want to find the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole. So what I need to know is the moles of barium chloride. Since I know the mass, I can easily find the moles. So the mass divided by the molar mass will tell me how many moles of barium chloride that I dissolved. So now to find the delta H in kilojoules per mole, I just have to first change this to kilojoules. So divide by 1,000, 2.76144. Divide by my moles. And now I'll use my proper sig figs. I end up with a positive delta H, because it's endothermic, 46,000 joules per mole. But as it said, in kilojoules per mole, per mole that's 46 kilojoules per mole. Another very common question, oops, sorry. I thought I had another problem to show you, but I was, another very common thing is to find heats of neutralization, like if I put hydrochloric acid into sodium hydroxide, and we do that when we do acids and bases in more detail later in the course. But perhaps you would see a problem like this, and again, when you do this, you would assume 4.184 for your specific heat. You would add the volumes of your hydrochloric acid and your sodium hydroxide to get your mass of solution. So again, it would be the total of your two compounds. And then your delta T, of course, would be your delta T. I hope this is helpful, and see you again soon.